We are living at the beginning of the third wave of the digital age. And things are about to get very interesting. At least that's what history tells us. Because just over a hundred years ago, the world went through the third wave of the Industrial Revolution and that changed everything, setting up a century of change and growth and development like we have never seen before. My 98-year-old grandmother was there to witness the beginning of that workplace revolution. And just a few weeks ago, uh, I was able to participate in a conversation between my near-centurion grandmother and uh, her great-granddaughters, my children. Uh, I've got three daughters, 13, 11, and 7. And it is a digital age. We didn't think names were necessary. <laughs> My wife, <laughs> my wife insisted. So Amy, uh, Hannah, and Rebecca were sitting speaking to my grandmother, Ethel. And it was amazing as I heard her reminisce about her near 100 years in thinking that actually the biggest workplace revolutions of her lifetime took place in the very first few years of her life. You see, back in 1911, a man by the name of Frederick Taylor presented a paper to the Mechanical Engineering Association of America. It was entitled, The Principles of Scientific Management. And this laid the roadmap for the third wave of the Industrial Revolution, a roadmap that many companies are still following a century later. The third wave. There are three waves in every revolution. The first wave of the Industrial Revolution, just as in the first wave of any revolution, is when inventors, entrepreneurs, thinkers come up with a new idea. In the Industrial Era, it was the idea of a machine, an engine. Steam-driven and then coal and oil-fired engines. And most often, the inventors don't actually know what these things can be used for to their full extent. They just push them out into the public and we pick up their most obvious uses. That's the first wave. The second wave follows fairly quickly and that's the application of those particular inventions and machines to every aspect of life, to every industry. That happened in the industrial era as every other industry saw the potential of automation and machines bringing power and speed to their industries. Spinning jennies and automated looms for the textile industry, planes, trains and automobiles for the, uh, our transportation needs, telegraphs, telephones for communication, uh, the automated printing press for the publishers, and so the list goes on. The third wave of a revolution takes slightly longer. This is when we realize that these new inventions are not just there to help us do what we used to do, but do it better, cheaper, and faster. That's what the second wave achieves. But now, suddenly we realize that these inventions, these machines, can help us to do things that we've never been able to do before, to do them in ways we could never have conceived. That's where Frederick Taylor comes in. He had been a mechanical engineer in one of the big steel mills of industrialized America. And early in his career, he realized that if we were to analyze, deeply understand how work worked, and we were to take the lessons from the machines and apply it to how people worked, separating out management and workers, breaking up jobs into their small component parts, we could make significant improvements in the world of work, significant advances in productivity and efficiency. And he was right. He became, in the early 20th century, the first, probably the first real management consultant, selling his ideas to whoever would listen, and lots of people did. Business leaders across the world picked up these principles of scientific management, brought them into their companies, and changed the world forever. And that was what was happening when my grandmother was born. A century later, she lives in a world that is facing a digital revolution, a third wave of a digital revolution. And we have the same potential right now as existed a hundred years ago to reconfigure how we work, to discover not just how to do what we know to do, but better, cheaper, and faster, but actually to do things we've never thought of before, to do them in ways we haven't conceived before, and to change the way the world works. 
You might feel, as I do, that the last 20 or 30 years have seen a remarkable change in how we work and the technologies we have available to us, but we've only been through the first two waves of the digital age. The third is yet to come, and this promises to be even more disruptive than anything we've experienced. The first wave of the digital age, clearly, these are the machines, the computers, the microprocessors, the internet, our smartphones, the actual objects. And the second wave of the digital era is how we have used those objects, those machines, in every industry, every aspect of our lives. We are learning how to do what we know better, cheaper, and faster because of technology. And we have companies, so Amazon come in and they revolutionize retail and distribution. And uh, we've got Apple playing in the music industry, changing how we consume our entertainment. You've got Google moving into driverless cars and augmented reality glasses. We can have our DNA sequenced for $300 in less than a day. And 3D printing is going to revolutionize the manufacturing world just as robots become more human. Again, the list of applications of our ability to process information and make our lives cheaper, better, and faster is endless. But it's just the second wave. The third wave is where we find ourselves right now. And this is our potential to change the way we work, to change the way the world is put together. And that's what I believe we need to embrace. Yes, the first and second waves are there, but the third wave is where all the exciting stuff happens. The third wave is a promise to set us up for a century of new forms of growth, a century of change, not only in our work, but in our world. And we need to embrace this change. There's so many ways in which we could do that. So many ways in which we could reconfigure our world. But with our theme today, the future of work, the power to make a difference, let me focus in on four starting points in the world of work in particular. Ways in which we can accelerate the shift into the third wave of the digital age. The first starting point, I believe, is in how we use technology. You see, when I started work 20-odd years ago at KPMG, companies had all the great technology. Uh, companies had access to the best hardware, the most up-to-date software. I had to go into the office to get the best machines, to use the latest software, to have the fastest connection speeds. I couldn't afford that stuff at home. But of course, that's changed. Uh, most of us now have more computing power uh, than any of our companies are prepared to give us and to give us access to. Worse than that, worse than that, most of your companies will actively block your ability to use the best technology. They won't allow you to bring the stuff you want to use to work. Uh, we've got a command and control approach to IT that we have to escape from. Really, who put IT in charge is, I suppose, what I'm asking. <laughs> because most of the big corporate IT departments not only block your uh, ability to use the technology you would be most comfortable with and would be most productive using, they also actively block your access to social media, to the connectivity you need to do your job in the digital age. And they do that because IT is focused on compliance and security rather than business value and functionality. This is a problem. We need to radically accelerate our acceptance and integration of the bring your own device, the BYOD mindset. That people are able to say, I know what technology I work best with and I can use that. It's an open source IT type of environment. Not necessarily in reality from the technical side, but in a mindset. And escaping the tyranny of a command and control IT department. But it does actually go a little bit further than that. If you're in IT, that was a message for you. Speak to me during the break. <laughs> But if you're not in IT, there is something that you can do as well. And that is that you can escape from the tyranny of your machines. If the third wave of the industrial era taught us anything, it was that machines 
can enslave us. We can become slaves to the processes and the systems we devise. And I fear many people are in danger of becoming slaves to these computing machines that we have devised. Switch off your smartphone. Step away from your inbox. And I dare you, next time you go away on holiday, put an autoresponder which says, thank you for your email, it has been deleted. I am on holiday. <laughs> I will be back in two weeks' time. If you still think I need this information, you're free to send it again. <laughs> we need... <laughs> we need to learn how to use our technology rather than letting our technology use us. Okay. Starting point number two is to change where and when we work. We have an addiction to the office. This made sense in the industrial age. The factory, the office, that was where our stuff was. That was where the tools were. That's where labor and value happened. That's not true anymore. I think you might have noticed. And we need to get away from an addiction, a herd mentality of all coming in and all leaving at exactly the same time. We don't need to do that. We've been talking about this for so long, I don't even want to utter the words work-life balance. It's not about that. It's not about flexi working. It's not about working from home. It's a change of mindset. Most of the business leaders I work with all around the world in different industries haven't even heard of Elance or Odesk or one of the other virtual team providers. They don't even know that this concept exists. Their mindset of management is that people have to be present. I supervise because I can see you. This is not true. We know it, but we haven't changed how we work. This is not about the technology. It's not just about working from home. It is a mindset shift to get away from the tyranny of presenteeism the need to be there and the need that many leaders have to have you there as a way of controlling and managing and supervising you. And this leads to the third starting point and that is we have to change how we measure and reward ourselves. My eldest daughter a few years ago when she was nine years old uh, was on school holiday and partly to keep her busy but partly to help me I asked her to get involved in just capturing a whole lot of information I had into a database. It wasn't difficult work but it was monotonous and I thought that she would uh, do it for me. Uh, <laughs> three children, three slaves, that's my uh, mentality. Anyway, we, we set her up, she was good to go uh, and I thought she would do it out of love. She was nine. <laughs> no chance, though. As I was about to leave the room, she just said, Dad, how much are you going to pay me? <laughs> Taken a little bit by surprise, I, I kind of said, well, Amy, what, what about two pounds an hour? She thought for a few seconds, and then she said, that's fine. But Dad, do you mind if I work really slowly? <laughs> How is, it, how is it that a nine-year-old has worked out what all of the HR professionals in the world have not? <laughs> that this is not how we should be measuring and rewarding people. In the industrial age, yes, measure time and pay for it. But in this age, the digital age, in the third wave, we need to measure outputs, we need to measure contributions, and we need to pay people for that. By the way, this is already happening. Your CEO is already demanding this. Your CEO says, I can be paid, you know what, it's 231 times what the average worker is paid. Why? Because your CEO contributes a lot. Apparently, CEOs think they can be measured accurately and rewarded appropriately for contribution. So why can't we? Technology enables that. My final starting point is a simple one. It's why we work. Not how we work and how we do things, but why we work. This third age 
this third wave of the digital age is being driven as much by the, the insatiable demands of commerce and the, the unrelenting march of history as it is by our human hunger for meaning and purpose. And technology is allowing us to connect more. Technology is allowing us to have more fun. Technology could drive a wedge between us, but it also has the power to connect. Technology could enslave us, but it also has the power to liberate. The choice is ours. My 98-year-old grandmother will not live to see how this digital revolution unfolds. But my oldest daughter, Amy, will. She was born in 1999. Genetics and demography and modern medicine are all on her side. She will live well beyond her 100th birthday. She will see three centuries. And if my daughters and their children, my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren, if they are to live in a better world than I've lived in, to live better lives than I've lived, well then we need to embrace this third wave of the digital age. Embrace it fully. We do indeed have the power to make a difference in the future of work. Thank you.